So this talk is about static typing, which is uh, uh, less uh, data science and less Pythonic probably than, uh, than usual. Uh, but nevertheless, it's something I found uh, useful in, uh, in the process of building uh, data products. Uh, for the nice to meet you slide, I also put the PyData London logo in case you didn't notice the high visibility t-shirt. Uh, I'm one of the organizers, in fact. And uh, maybe you notice also the little posters around about the book signing that was also introduced in the, in the opening notes. So uh, I'll be do the signing. I have a few free copies of my book on uh, social media mining. And uh, also some uh, discount codes if uh, there's something you're interested in. We'll also have uh, Ian having a few uh, copies of his book on uh, high performance computing. And uh, Rebecca with uh, her book on uh, natural language processing. So that will be interesting. And uh, recently, I've also been working again with uh, my publisher, Pack Publishing. And uh, we released uh, a series of uh, videos on uh, data analysis with Python. OK, now back, uh, back on topic. Uh, the starting point is essentially every conversation I ever have with uh, uh, developers who are not coming from a Python background. We always end up discussing you know, pros and cons of the languages. And uh, the bottom line is uh, Python is really typed. Well, not really. Uh, the correct statement is that Python is strongly typed. But the source of the confusion is coming from the fact that Python is also dynamically typed. So this will be a bit of a slow introduction to uh, Python typing before we move on to, to, to the static uh, typing notions. Uh, so what do we mean by strong and uh, dynamic? So we do have data types. So in this example, we have uh, simply an integer. Uh, but there is no need to declare it. So the interpreter is inferring the data type dynamically. And we also have uh, type errors. So some operations like uh, summing a string to an, in to an integers are not allowed. So the interpreter will raise uh, a type error in this case. The nature of uh, the dynamic nature of, of Python anyway sometimes uh, leads to some uh, kind of what the hell moment. So that's when uh, the uh, developers coming from a, a static background uh, they start cringing. So you can mix up sometimes the types. In this example, Booleans are treated as integers. That's because Booleans effectively are a subset of int in, uh, in Python. This is all documented. But when you're new to Python, uh, maybe it's surprising. So you can sum a Boolean with, uh, to an integer. You can multiply an integer with a Boolean, and so on. And in terms of uh, type errors, back to the, to the previous example, Sometimes some operations are allowed, like you can multiply a string times a number, and that's a string concatenation, and others are not allowed, so they will raise a type error. So this is a bit uh, confusing sometimes. Now, in Python, there's this notion of uh, duck typing, which is uh, basically, it's more like a mindset, if you want. Uh, I think the the term uh, was uh, originally coined by Alex Martelli a few years back. And uh, I'm not sure there's a formal definition. So this is what I found out, essentially. This is what you usually find on the, on the web, on Wikipedia, and so on. So duck typing, if it looks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, then probably it is a duck. So in short, if it quacks, it's a duck. To better understand uh, the, the idea of duck typing, we can compare the two different mindset or principles. And they both have uh, a fancy acronym, but really the ideas behind them are, are really uh, simple. So the first one, EAFP, which is the one uh, uh, mostly adopted in, uh, in Python, most uh, Pythonic, if you want. So it's coming from uh, this idea, this notion, that it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission. Grace Hopper was. Uh, the lady who wrote the first compiler, and she did also many other things. And she also inspired generations of uh, computer scientists. So it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is to get permission. On the other side, the opposite principle is then to ask for permission first. And uh, also, we have another fancy acronym. This is also called look before you leap. Look before you leap means uh, we are testing the preconditions before making our calls. And I just want to give you an example of uh, look before you leap first. 
So say you want to call your, uh, your duck, you want to make it quack. So first you check if the object supports the particular operation. You check that the object duck has the method uh, quack. And then you call uh, duck quack. And that's all right. Uh, but what's happening here is that you're accessing the, uh, the object twice. First to check if the method is there and then to actually call the method. And back to our asking for forgiveness, so the Pythonic way of doing things. We don't check first, we just try to call directly the, uh, the method and if something goes wrong, we uh, capture the exception and then we deal with it. Now, if, you, uh, if you've been doing this approach for a while, maybe you noticed this is not the perfect way of doing things. You shouldn't capture any exception, you should uh, make sure that you capture only the specific exception. So a better way of doing it would be capture the attribute error, meaning the duck object does not have uh, the quack attribute, or maybe capture a type error if you want. Anyway, make sure that you capture the correct exception. Now wrapping everything up with this notion of uh, asking forgiveness and duck typing, it also means if we have an object which is not a duck, Let's say it's a dog, but if the dog can quack, we don't care, it's good enough for us. Still a duck from our point of view. So that's the idea of duck typing. We don't focus on, the, on what the object is, we focus on the behavior, we focus on what the object can do and how we can use it, so we focus on the interface and on the behavior. And this is all interesting. Uh, it makes for a good uh, philosophical conversation after a few pints. Uh, it's not only philosophical, it's also, it has some practical implications here. So there's some important questions uh, that we should think about. How many type-related errors we can catch before runtime? That's an important point in uh, static versus dynamic typing. So often people um, put, the, put languages in two different uh, classes, so it's really a binary classification, static versus dynamic. But really it's a bit more like a continuum, so uh, le different languages behave in different ways, right? So it's not always clear static versus dynamic. For example, JavaScript, with the 1 plus 1 example from earlier, strings and integers, the result will be the string 11. So the sum between string and integers is allowed in JavaScript. Now, I'm not saying JavaScript is more dynamic than Python. Uh, I'm saying they just behave differently. And then, of course, you can put uh, kind of Haskell off the chart. Uh, you can put Scala somewhere in between. So Scala is statically typed, but also the compiler has some uh, capabilities to do type inference. So that there's also a dynamic aspect in it. So it's not really a binary classification. Uh, that's one way of looking at things. But then usually people anyway are very, very polarized. So they go, they really like the binary classification. So this slide should be benefits of uh, dynamic typing, but the attitude al always is, uh, I like dynamic typing, leave me alone. So the benefits of uh, dynamic typing, mainly flexibility. So, so you don't have the constraints of uh, static typing. And uh, looking at the language, and uh, Python is particularly good here, it's less verbose, so you have less code to write, essentially, you don't bother about the, the static typing. And uh, the feeling overall is that you write code uh, faster. The opposite direction, so benefits of uh, static typing, and again, the attitude is how can you deal, uh, how can you live without it? It's about catching errors before runtime, so the compiler does the job for you, uh, often, of uh, catching some of the silly mistakes that you do because you don't check uh, properly for, you don't capture the right exception or you don't check for the correct type and so on. Also, static typing has uh, the benefit of being a kind of a inline uh, documentation because you declare your function uh, definition so you know uh, what kind of attributes, uh, uh, sorry, what kind of arguments uh, you're expecting, what kind of uh, type you're giving back and so on. Also, there's better support for uh, your uh, editors. <coughs> you can have support for uh, kind of autocomplete and stuff like that, also with dynamic typing. But in static typing, you have uh, just a better, uh, better support here. And finally, uh, 
static typing also allows, to, allows the compiler to do some optimization and I put it in bracket because it's not really what we do in Python. Uh, so it's a kind of a generic uh, benefit of static typing, but it's not, it's not happening in Python. So we can, uh, we can cross it out. Okay, I've tried to kind of balance a few benefits on both sides, dynamic and static. Uh, and now I just want to discuss some extra problems or little issues that we have. Uh, so winning the World Cup is not a problem that I have. This is a rugby scrum. From uh, an outsider point of view, uh, it looks very messy. But then if you are a rugby player or if you know about rugby, you know that basically everybody has a precise role. They know how to bind, they know where to push, when to push. So they, they clearly know what they're doing. And that's kind of like a data science team. From uh, an outsider point of view, what are these data scientists doing? Uh, but then from an insider, we always know what we're doing, right? Do we? No. <laughs> okay, so with these little problems that I want to mention, so teams are changing, they're growing, uh, there's some turnover, so you have new people coming in. If you hire them, it's because they know what they're doing, probably, but then they don't really know, they're not familiar with the code base, they're not familiar with the process, so it takes time to get people up to speed. Refactoring is also something that uh, nobody really likes, but uh, it's part of the job. So you fix something on one side and then you break something somewhere else. Documentation, uh, it's always poor, right? It's never enough. And finally, testing, unit testing. Uh, you know, you should be realistic and uh, kind of honest with yourself. We don't write enough unit tests. That's, that's the hard reality. And I would argue with all these little problems, kind of uh, they're part of the long-term uh, uh, process of uh, building uh, stable, solid, robust products. And uh, here the edges are a bit in favor of uh, static typing. So static typing is something that helps in, uh, um, doesn't solve all these problems, but it's a tool that helps tackling all these problems. So what's going on with Python? With Python, since uh, Python 3.0, so we're talking about more than 10 years ago, we have this notion of function annotations. And i just give you an example. Function annotations, you have your function definition. Uh, this one takes a couple of arguments, A and B, and you can declare the expected data type for the arguments, in this case, two integers. And then with the little arrow thing, you can also declare the return type of the function, which is a string in this example. Annotations are really ignored by the interpreter. So this is uh, like a syntax support. The syntax is legal, but the interpreter is not doing anything about it. Then more recently, Python 3.5, we have this notion of type hintings. So the typing module has been introduced in Python 3.5, and that's uh, what makes the typing system a, a bit more semantically coherent. So we have a lot of uh, abstract data types declared in the typing module. And again, annotations are really ignored by the interpreter. Uh, so what's going on in practice? We have support for the syntax, we have support for the semantics, but the interpreter is ignoring the type annotations. So in practice, you need an external tool to perform static analysis. And uh, for Python, we have this tool called MyPy. It's the GitHub page of MyPy, optional st static typing for Python. So, how to go with it? Uh, you just uh, install it with pip install mypy, and then uh, it's uh, a command line tool. You just run it, mypy, followed by the script name or the folder where you have your, uh, uh, your package, your, uh, your program in general. So I want to give you a slightly more detailed example here. So you have these abstract data types in the typing module, a list and a dictionary in this example, and uh, Notice the uppercase L and D. So we have list and dictionary all lowercase as kind of built-in data type in Python, but we also have this abstract data type declared in uh, the typing module. And uh, if you notice, so here this function is taking an integer as input and giving back a dictionary. If you notice, the uh, B variable is also declared using a, an inline command 
as a list of integers. So the abstract data type from the typing module allows for indexing. Okay, so you can declare this is a list, but it's not only a list, it's a list of integers. So you can really um, have a better granularity while using the default built-in data type, you cannot do this kind of indexing. Now we are declaring the function as returning a dictionary and uh, we are really returning a list. That's what's happening in this piece of code. So once you run uh, MyPy, what happens is that you're going to have uh, an error raised, so incompatible return value type. You were uh, uh, expecting a dictionary and uh, you're giving back a list. So that's, uh, that's the overall idea of MyPy. So the interpreter will still run the code but the MyPy tool for, for static analysis will give you the error if you do this uh, analysis checking. Um, in the error message, I also want to point out the dictionary is given as uh, any to any. We didn't declare anything about the dictionary. So by default, the dictionary is about anything essentially. And this opens for the next uh, concept, which is gradual typing. Gradual typing basically means that we don't go from dynamic to static overnight, we do it gradually. And uh, the any data type uh, is something that reduces the friction. So uh, sometimes you're not really sure about your code base, you need to kind of check what's going on. So you can place uh, any data type and then you can refine it later on. And this is part of a process of going through iterations to, to kind of uh, have a better understanding of your code base and uh, slowly add uh, additional types to your code. So we mentioned list, dictionary, this type any, so just want to quickly go through a few of the supported types. So from the type of module, you can get list, dictionary, tuples, and so on. Then you have some more fancy things, iterable objects. These are all indexable, so you can also specify what they contain. And then you have optional uh, kind of data types the meaning should be, should be clear. You have unions, when uh, a function can take uh, arguments of different types and you can make a union. And then the any data type that we already mentioned. And then we have many more. On top of this, you can of course still use all the built-in data types and uh, also your custom objects. In terms of uh, Python requirements, so the typing module has been introduced in Python 3.5. So if, if you want to take advantage of it, you need Python 3.5. You can use any 3.3 plus to run MyPy. And you can even do annotations if you have uh, a code base in Python 2. But in this case, the annotation have to be as uh, inline comments rather than using the function annotation syntax. Uh, here the issue would be you still need uh, MyPy to run uh, the analysis. So the idea is you kind of integrate MyPy with your build server running Python 3 to do the static checking on your Python 2 code base. But you can still do it anyway. Uh, so when do you do the uh, static uh, checking? Well, you can run it from the command line, so you know as many times as you want. What I like to do, usually when things become a little bit more stable, I try to kind of wrap it up into a shell script <coughs> that can be integrated in your build server, your CI server. And uh, I tend to group everything together with the linter to do some extra static checking. If you don't use uh, Flake 8 or PyLint or any other linter, check them out. They help you to catch uh, some of the easy to spot mistakes that uh, maybe you don't notice in a bigger code base. And then of course unit testing because we are all writing unit testing, unit tests. And uh, you can run them with uh, Nose, with PyTest, with uh, whatever you like, coverage, there are many options. And then finally, the static type analysis with MyPy. So if you integrate it with your uh, build server, uh, uh, is it going to slow me down? Fair question. And I was going to talk about caching and all the stuff. Uh, the short answer is no. It's not slow, it's fast enough. Probably your unit tests are going to be slower than uh, the static analysis. What's going on with the third party libraries? Uh, that's a bit of a pain. So you still need uh, to, to kind of in understand the interfaces of the libraries. So there's an ongoing effort of uh, writing all the interfaces for the most common 
uh, Python library. So these are already part of MyPy, for example, request and uh, LXML and a few other libraries are already there. Otherwise, you need to sort of write uh, the interface definition and put it in a PYI, Python interface, stub file. So the stub file, they only contain the interfaces, they don't contain the actual behavior. And they're used by MyPy to understand how to deal with uh, some custom data types. Another option, uh, ignore the third-party libraries. Sometimes it's just a way to, to go if you don't want to get stuck. Uh, if you are in this process of doing uh, gradual typing, that's where you start. So you say, we follow the imports, but then we silence the errors. And then there are probably 50 plus options for, for my type, so my pie, so you can check them out. About the errors, you can skip them, you can uh, report them, you can do whatever you like. Okay. Uh, so static typing really sort of clashes with uh, the notion of duck typing. On one side, uh, you, you want to focus on behavior rather than uh, um, identity and uh, the precise data type. On the other side, I'm saying uh, static typing is, uh, is kind of helpful in, in these little problems. And the idea is, uh, this is the last uh, stock image, I promise. The idea is, uh, yeah, um, there's no free lines lunch so you need to to find the balance it's true that uh, static typing and uh, duck typing are probably clashing it's true that static typing sometimes doesn't feel very pythonic so if you are heavily invested in python uh, you might find it a bit awkward at first and uh, all in all i'm not uh, i'm not really advocating static typing i'm not a big fan of static typing something that i found useful anyway and uh, especially when you're kind of uh, graduating from uh, doing little prototypes towards uh, building mature and solid products. So in these three particular uh, bullet points, I'm, I'm just summarizing where I think static typing is, is most useful. So going from prototype to a mature, robust data product, understanding your code base, and also in particular when you have uh, heterogeneous teams, new people coming in. Not everybody is coming from a Python background. Okay. Uh, one of my last jobs, uh, I was working with C-sharp developers and they were uh, catching up quite quickly because uh, we introduced these uh, this, uh, static types in uh, some of our libraries. So that's really helpful when uh, you have people coming from different backgrounds and maybe they like static types, so you kind of help them out. Okay, so... Uh, that's it for, for me. I believe we have a few minutes for, uh, for questions. Uh, I'll be anyway around uh, today and tomorrow. should be easy to find and I should be easy to find online as well. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of what kind of uh, projects, uh, machine learning projects, uh, data pipelines, so where's the mix of data engineering and data science, um, and uh, especially things that are kind of becoming mature. So up for the early days of your prototypes, not really useful, it's probably getting in the way. And then later on when things are more stable, you kind of look at the, at the build server and you notice that the last 30 problems were about uh, some, uh, some type uh, error not being properly handled. And that's when uh, uh, things are useful. But yeah, absolutely, scikit-learn uh, kind of models, um, data pipelines, um, and so on. And in terms of uh, 
this friction that you mentioned, so in TypeScript, I, I don't know TypeScript, but it's the same in Ocean from, from what you described. So the, the question is, uh, if I use uh, a lot of uh, any and gradual typing, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of using uh, static typing, yes. I, I agree, it's, uh, it's not an overnight uh, uh, process and it's not an overnight success either, so you kind of need to uh, follow the, this idea of gradual typing. So you slowly improve your understanding of your huge code base. I'm assuming there's a big code base and that there's a mature product to, to build rather than simple scripts. Uh, so probably most of the times you import a lot of libraries where you actually would need to define their own types in your code. Yes, so with third-party libraries I agree that it's a bit of a pain and there's an ongoing effort in building this type shed so some of it is already part of my Pi for a few uh, basic Python libraries and then for some of the library that uh, the Daniel here uh, working for uh, Machinalis, they have been open sourcing something with NumPy. So if you're using NumPy you can uh, check out this third party. So there are a few companies uh, putting some effort into it and things are getting better slowly. So. Uh, this uh, static type in Notion really kicked off less than two years ago, I would say, and uh, it's still, uh, still improving. I agree that it's not perfect. I'm just saying it's like an extra tool for you. Yes? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your development workflow. Yes. And how MyPy kind of fits into your process. So, for instance, you've mentioned like um, the unit tests. So for, for me, for unit tests, you know, I need run nodes like right before you merge a branch into master just to make sure it's not gonna melt down. So is it analogous for you? Like when are you, you know, at what point are you kind of running my pie? Okay, so about the overall process workflow, um, kind of similar. So the script that I showed is a novelly simplified version of what I usually do. I put together uh, some uh, linting for the obvious uh, kind of style uh, little errors and also capturing a few things like uh, undeclared names and so on. I put together unit test and I put together my Pi and this is going to be wired up with your build server. Uh, depending on, on what I'm doing, depending on if, if it's like um, a moment of uh, heavy development or whatever, I might run it more often locally and then I push a little bit left off often so I kind of commit locally and then I push uh, once I'm uh, a bit more confident. Uh, it re it's really something that um, it's easy to integrate in the workflow if you wire it up with, uh, with your build server. And uh, it goes together with, uh, with a linter, in my opinion, because linting is also about static analysis, not static type analysis, but also, uh, anyway, static analysis. So, yeah, it's, um, it's not coming up in the early days of, the, of a project while uh, unit tests are coming up for, for me from day one. Um, so I tend to add it a little bit later, but yeah. Any other question? Yeah, please. Um, I was just wondering if you knew of any IDs that had plugins in the uh, So the, do I know any IDE? Uh, the truth is I don't really use IDE. I like a very lightweight um, editor and then uh, I do my own uh, shell scripts and then depending on the team I'm working with I kind of follow what they're doing. So if they have a, a Jenkins server, that's what I use. If they have other uh, standards, I, um, as, as a freelance I, I kind of try to adopt uh, what uh, the team is doing and. Uh, and see how we can re reduce the friction. For me, I like uh, lightweight uh, editors. Um, yeah, I guess I uh, should talk with the JetBrain uh, guys. Yeah, yeah I, th I think PyCharm picks up on it. Yeah, so absolutely. It, um, it So I think there's, uh, there's an ongoing effort also in uh, bringing these new notions of static typing into the, the tools that are commonly used. 
so PyCharm absolutely. They were already doing something using the inline commands. I didn't feel like uh, it was, uh, sometimes for me it was a bit awkward, but maybe it's just me. Uh, yeah, things are also improving Sublime Atom apparently. Any other question? Thank you.